Good evening, everybody. How you doing out there? We're going to just take another minute or so to let people trickle in. So glad you could join us this evening. We'll get started in just about half a minute. So hang tight. Stay close to your screens. All right. I'm going to look at the participant list. Get a feeling for who's with us this evening. Oh, we got people all over the valley. My goodness. St. Helena. Calistoga, some folks in Napa, lots of Napa, a few from San Francisco. That's always encouraging. Um, all right. So let's get the proceedings underway. My name is Terrence Mulligan. Um, I'm the president and CEO of Napa Valley Community Foundation. I'm so glad you could take a minute to join us this evening. As some of you already know, uh, Napa Valley Community Foundation works side by side with local donors and nonprofits to tackle the most important challenges our valley faces. We believe that a prosperous community rises from a strong foundation. So every day we gather generous hearts and bright minds to solve the problems that lie just beneath the surface of this beautiful place that we call home because when we harness the power of our collective generosity, we become a force for good, making life better for everyone in Napa. Last year, with help from many of you on the Zoom call, we distributed a little more than $7 million. We invested in youth through scholarship programs. We're the largest provider of scholarships in Napa County, about $300,000 across 80 to 100 youth. We fought poverty by launching an innovative housing program that is aimed to, to accelerate the adoption of accessory dwelling units, which is a much faster, cheaper way to get inventory for our, our, our workforce. And we championed community by investing for the seventh year in a row in a program called the One Napa Valley Initiative that has helped nearly 1600 people, immigrants all, mostly from Mexico, become US citizens in the last uh, five and a half, six years. Um, this year of necessity, we've been focused on disasters. So just since March, we've put out a, a little more than 5 million to blunt the health and economic effects of COVID-19. And we have put out about 2 million thus far uh, to address the needs of those affected by the wildfires. Uh, we had back-to-back -back wildfires here as all local people will know. Um, so what do we do when we're not moving uh, other people's resources around Napa Valley and cutting grant checks? We try to build a stronger community. And one way that we do that is just by fostering conversation like this and fostering learning and a sense of connection among our residents, always in a nonpartisan, even-handed way, always with the help of outside experts and thinkers such as our uh, special guest tonight, Dean Rakesh Karana from Harvard College. So I don't need to tell anybody it's been a rocky year. It's been a really, really difficult year. And if we're lucky enough to, to be healthy, to have the luxury of telecommuting, it's still difficult. And it's especially difficult uh, for families and students. My own son, Francis, who's uh, 14 and a freshman at Vintage High School, I just, my heart aches for what he's living through. He's like, he's getting a dose of half a day, two days a week. And I, I remember so fondly and with no small amount of terror, my own experience as a freshman in high school. It's sort of like each of us is looking at life as a parade through a keyhole because we are separated from one another in this way. Um, so I'm really eager to hear uh, what Dean Karan has to say about post-secondary education at an elite university like Harvard. Uh, before we begin, um, a few procedural bits. We're all pros by now in the ways of Zoom. So we're, we're going to record this so we can share it with others who weren't able to join us. As much as we'd like to see you, there's too many of you to do that and have it be workable. So your video is turned off and, and you're muted. Um, we would love to hear your questions as we go through. And I think the way that we want you to do that is to, uh, let's see, how do we want to do that? The Q&A icon down at the bottom. So the Q&A icon, just type your questions in. We'll do our very best to get to them. So you all saw uh, my old friend Rakesh's bio in our invitation. So I'll just remind you that he's a professor of sociology and organizational behavior at Harvard University and a former, former faculty dean of the Cabot House. He became the Danoff Dean of Harvard College on July 1, 2014. And uh, Small World is, uh, Rakesh was a classmate of, uh, of mine, a section mate of mine at Harvard Business School. And here's the thing, Harvard Business School is an elite uh, you know, MBA program. And there's 85 people in a room together for a year. But there's always like three or four people who you think, oh, 
good Lord, that person is really, really going places. And Rakesh was such a person. So I'm really thrilled. Yes, it's true. I'm not just buttering you up for old time's sake. So I'm really thrilled you're here. So I'm going to um, begin by asking you a question. So what has this crazy fall semester been like um, at, at Harvard? Well, first of all, Terrence, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm just so grateful um, for uh, the invitation. And I also just want to extend, uh, you know, to everyone who's on this call, thank you for joining us. I know what a hard year this has been, um, you know, especially for those of you in Napa Valley, um, not only the physical toll of the vi virus and its reverberations for so many of your communities, the, the wildfires are, hearts were all, uh, you know, with all of you knowing what the challenges people were facing. And then on top of this, uh, you know, the economic and the social and sort of sense of you know need for justice uh, that I think we all feel and we're grappling with, um, and um, you know especially for those of you, thank you for joining us. I know the sort of feelings of Zoom isolation um, and our struggle to maintain personal connections at a time when we need them the most. So um, I just really appreciate you uh, inviting me to this, and um, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, all the folks um, you know in in your community uh, and the work that they're doing, and uh, to sort of. Uh, help each other and help those who are suffering. So, uh, but I'm really appreciative. So, so you know, um, how's it been? Uh, I guess in that sense, um, you know, um, I was really inspired by you starting with the mission um, of your organization. So I'll briefly start with the mission of ours and I'll sort of put that in context because I think the mission has just been just as important even more as a kind of guiding set of principles for us. So the mission of Harvard College, um, where I'm Dean has been for almost four centuries now to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. Um, it's a mission our college actually takes quite seriously. We helped educate some of the people who imagine this country and its aspirations. Um, our students, our faculty, our staff were some of the people who helped lead the uh, abolition movements and anti-slavery movements. Um, in fact, other than the two oldest military academies, no institution has given more lives in service of its nation than the college. And other than the two oldest military academies, no institution has more people who've been awarded the Medal of Honor than the college. And so this notion of service and service leadership runs through so many dimensions of our collective social, political, economic life, civil rights, women's rights, equality of marriage, uh, trying to reinterpret the past to help you know, shape our present and understand our future. And like our own society, there's a great deal that we are quite proud of but also recognition that Harvard hasn't been as inclusive as it should have been and still could be. So we recognize that our aspirations run ahead of our reality. Um, but we do this through our belief in the transformative power of the liberal arts and sciences education. And for us, it begins with the intellectual transformation, uh, new ways of knowing, new ways of understanding all toward the goal of developing an independent mind, where students really gain a deep appreciation for the role of reason and evidence, the importance of searching for the truth uh, but also having the humility to realize that the truth is something hard to, to, to attain. It's something that has to be discovered, uncovered. Um, and you know, many of the things that we once believed to be true turn out to be more contingent, complex, or even untrue. And so what we try to do is embed that in a very diverse living and learning experience where students study alongside students who are different from them, who come from different walks of life, have different identities, evolving identities, which we believe not only deepens the intellectual transformation, but sets the conditions for a social transformation our understanding of what it means to be part of a community, that a community is not just a collection of interests and dialogue is not simply the exchange of claims and counterclaims where we're hoping our students learn to see behind each other's eyes to hear from another's perspective. And then through those experiences, we hope our students begin to answer some questions for themselves. Who am I and who do I wanna be? How do I relate to others and what can I learn from others? What are my gifts and talents and how can I best use them to serve the world? So uh, a personal transformation. Um, obviously for um, education, uh, K through 12, but higher education, uh, COVID uh, has really um, been quite challenging for us. Um, for us, it really disrupted, um, when I talk about our mission, um, it really often involves us gathering together um, um, to encounter each other, to uh, the role of serendipity, um, of sitting in a classroom and hearing a different perspective and a point of view, and then following up with that, um, sitting across a dining table where people are studying different subjects and, and um, you know, you're saying, wow, you and I were in the same class. How could you think so differently about that? Right. And realizing all of that. And so it's been quite disruptive. Um, we were fortunate. Um, we, um, you know, we had a complex history um, 
in trying to put up our program. Uh, we were one of the first schools to de-densify back in March. Um, and at that point, we, it was just us and a couple of West Coast schools um, that did this. Um, we were all criticized for kind of overreacting. Um, and then, um, you know, a few weeks soon, you know, we saw that kind of spreading around the country. And then, um, you know, I think we announced back in the summer that we were just going to be bringing back um, one class, uh, um, so two cohorts. So one is our first year students. We felt it was really important to give them an opportunity to just kind of have that, you know, sort of disjuncture from high school and what it means to become part of college and the sort of habits of mind. And then students whose learning environments at home weren't suitable um, to bring them back to campus. Um, when we first made that announcement in June, we were critiqued as being very too conservative. Uh, by the time we were opening up, uh, a few schools had already cut, you know, and stopped. They sent their students home and we were looking pretty aggressive. Uh, but what we've tried to do is stay pretty steady around that. Um, um, our, you know, um, we, uh, we basically depended on three things um, to keep our community going. And our students were fabulous about it, which is one, which is really critical is high cadence testing. So our students on campus were being tested three times a week. Uh, social distancing, uh, so they, you know, everybody had their own bedroom. So we did, you know, we brought back our smaller groups. So we gave every student their own bedroom, uh, and um, you know, uh, they practiced social distancing, uh, not gathering in large groups. And then third, the masking. Um, yeah. We were fortunate enough that all of that we had in our undergraduate community less than thirty six infections the whole semester. Wow. Um, so the, you know, how big is the undergraduate community? So we had we had about um, you know fifteen hundred students on campus, um, but you know since people are living in um, you know uh, 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 you know uh, large you know environments, this was really an experiment. And you know I think um, what we are seeing, and there was we weren't the only school to kind of do this. MIT and us did this together, and you know we kind of planned uh, these plans, and then several other schools in New England. Um, there were schools with zero infections, but it really turns out to be, we're really fortunate at Harvard to have a fabulous school of public health medical school. And so we're really guided by experts very early on about the importance of high cadence testing. And uh, we were able to put that together uh, early on. And uh, I think that's really been that as, in, as part of a multi-layered approach can show the path forward. And we're seeing that diffuse increasingly through, we're hoping that K through 12 schools, et cetera, will also begin to sort of see, uh, begin to adopt some of those practices. And we're starting to see that in Massachusetts. When you talk about cadence and the cadence being high, is it every two weeks that everyone is tested or how frequently? No, three times a week. Goodness so, gracious. So, yeah. So uh, it's actually fairly, <laughs> I mean, actually, I can show you the kit. Um, it's a self administered, um, here it is. Wow. Um, so it's a self-administered uh, process. Uh, uh, it's a Q-tip, uh, three swabs in the nose, and then it goes into this little um, uh, test tube. You just drop it off, and then uh, we're doing it with the Broad, and uh, they have, you know, been able to get results back often in 12 to 24 hours, which actually turns out also to be important. You do it multiple times a week and with fast results, and that helps you uh, prevent the. Um, um, asymptomatic infections. Of so people who are infected but uh, are not showing symptoms and that's a primary source of transmission. The, um, the New York Times has this segment called California Today, which you may not uh, read as a, as a resident of Massachusetts. Uh, but in it today, they interviewed uh, Dr. Michael Drake, who I think is the incoming or new UC president. And he talked and shared some data about this very thing at various campuses. And what was remarkable to me is that the positivity incidents on big campuses. So UC San Diego has 25,000 faculty, staff, and undergraduates, 10,000 undergrads living on campus. Their positivity rate is half a percent, whereas in the community at large around the university, it's six or seven. And it's similar all over the state. And it um, really, uh, I think, underscores the point that that thing that we all need is this rapid cadence testing. I wanted to ask as a follow-on, what about those 30? What about the contact tracing piece of it? Mm -hmm. um, what happens when the worst happens and, and you know, we have to do that? 
Yeah, great question. So, you know, and so, you know, when I talked about the 36, 37, those were undergraduates. Um, we also have, you know, we test our, uh, the staff that are coming in and also the contractors, et cetera. And, you know, there you see higher levels of community transmission, um, uh, exactly the way that you are describing it. And so it was actually turned out to be as, you know, students were safer on campus. Um, there are protocols that you have to follow for contact tracing. They are set by our public health commission. So uh, we respond both to the state as well as the city of Cambridge's or the city of Boston's public health, depending on where it was. So HBS, where we went to school, also had um, students on campus. So the college and HBS were the two schools that had the most students on campus. Um, and essentially what happens is that you, uh, you know, uh, are contacted, um, done in, um, you know, in confidence, but you're asked for your contacts in the last two days where you've had um, 15 minutes of exposure with somebody uh, uh, unmasked and, and essentially those folks are contacted and asked to quarantine. Yeah. Um, depending on the situation, um, you know, in many cases you often hear about quarantines for two weeks um, as you know, the CDC just changed the adjustment. But since we were also doing high cadence testing, um, we could also test people who were quarantined. And so sometimes they had two negative tests mm -hmm. um, after the space apart, they, they could come out of quarantine um, 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 again after appropriate time, but um, it allowed them to sort of at least be relieved of the kind of anxiety that, you know, are they positive or not? And um, uh, that was really helpful. So uh, people would be in quarantine. We typically let people quarantine in their own rooms and um, they would just, if, you know, if we, uh, they could go get food, um, um, but it would be masked in the dining halls and they'd bring it back. Um, and similarly, if those who were isolated, so who tested positive, uh, we had facilities for them where we would check in on them. Uh, there'd be a call from our university health services, check-ins from our uh, a tutor or an advisor, um, and then the food would be brought to them. And then after uh, the requisite time in which you have to stay in isolation, um, they would come out. Um, what's interesting is that once you've obviously had uh, COVID-19, uh, don't, you don't need to be tested anymore because you're always going to be tested showing those antibodies for a little while. Sure. Yeah. Have, I mean, have you or have other um, universities been contacted by other sorts of institutions that want to learn from this, this methodology? I mean, it seems like it's um, wouldn't be hard to replicate in other places where large numbers of people are together, you know, a hospital a meat processing plant, uh, a major employer. And I, you know, I'm just curious to know why we've not seen a broader adoption of this kind of um, intervention, really. Yeah, you know, well, one is I just want to acknowledge the privilege of us being able to do this. You know, yeah. we were fortunate enough to have the labs and uh, we worked through the Broad Institute, which is MIT Harvard Venture. And I think, you know, for me, candidly, that what's really frustrating is I think we, you know, could have gotten ahead of this, that we actually had a, a summer to do this more broadly, uh, nationally, um, and maybe with some focal points in the hospital systems focused on K through 12 education to put up some type of system. And now there's a lot of variations of what we're doing uh, that all seem to have some efficacy. So we did high cadence testing in other places they did pool testing. There's other places where they did random testing. And I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that this became, um, you know, a kind of what was, uh, you know, a, a fairly like, I think understandable playbook, um, you know, and in which many experts had spent many years thinking about this and what you would do under these situations. It's unfortunate that it became kind of divisive um, um, uh, and, you know, it's kind of, you know, how serious it was, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, well-intentioned, but, you know, I think just ended up on, on different pages and, um, and rather than talking, you know, uh, with each other, we were, you know, shouting past each other and, um, uh, uh, but I think, you know, we are seeing more and more institutions uh, looking at this uh, again, you know, it's, it, it's not a, it's, it wasn't a secret formula. Um, there was, you know, it was things that we could see also some of the nations, you know, that had gotten the first wave. Of course. Um, some of this was related to that. And, and the tests are fairly straightforward. Uh, they're also not very novel. Um, they're the kind of tests that, you know, when you mobilize appropriately, you can, you can get most of the materials and things like yeah. that. 
and it takes takes an investment of resources. And yeah. um, I'm looking at my friend Chuck, who's an educator, who says, "Wow, amazing! 12 to 24 hours." Um, I'm still waiting for my test results from a few days ago. And he asked, does Harvard process its own tests? Or maybe you just said, is it, is it in conjunction with MIT and Broad? Well, the Broad Institute is actually where we're doing it. We're, you know, um, the Broad Institute now actually has been processing. Um, there's a great article, I think, in the Boston Globe not a few days ago, hundreds of thousands of tests a day. I mean, they literally mobilized all of their machinery and equipment and redesigned the process. And you know, originally the turnaround was two, three days, and they have re-engineered it in a way that I candidly, there's played times at which I've dropped off my test at 8 a.m. in the morning and had the results at 6 p.m. Uh, um, and uh, these are the PCR tests. So they're not just the yeah. quick test, they're actually the ones that are sort of fairly um, uh, you know, uh, uh, high levels of um, you know, confidence. And so, you know, I think. Uh, they've been doing it for many schools. Um, um, <clears throat> there are schools that have put up their own. Um, um, Boston University, for example, has put up its own lab um, in processing their tests. Um, you know, we, we chose to do it through Broad uh, early on uh, because of its relationship with Harvard and MIT. And, but they now process, you know, Williams and Amherst and Dartmouth, they like drive in the van. Every day there's like a van that comes from down those places, a lot of these New England colleges and is bringing the test to Broad. And, you know, we set up some IT infrastructure where people would set up for texts when you, when you dropped your test off and then you'd get a text about where you could log in to get your results and things like that. Wonderful. Okay, so you're lighting up the boards here, Rakesh. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tuck into a few questions, if I may, from our audience. So Colleen, who's one of my wonderful and thoughtful new board members, is curious about the mental health of students on campus versus off campus. Are you tracking this? Um, you know, it's a it's a big deal, and I mean, you you talked about that relational piece that's that's missing that is that is both about one's education, uh, but also about one sort of social connection. Um, just curious to know. She's curious to know more about that. Well, thanks for that question. And um, mental health is something that we really do worry a great deal about. Um, already before uh, COVID, um, you know, I think there was a, a strong sense of um, you know mental health concerns and issues. Um, among our young adult community, um, especially college age, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and some are good reasons. You know, we have more folks in uh, uh, students coming to college with mental health, chronic mental health issues. And because of the advances in pharmacology and treatments, they, they are now able to be in higher education institutions would have been challenging for them to be before. So, and that we also know at this age is also when some mental health issues present themselves for the first time. So there's, so there's that element. There's a second element, which I think is the one that's being alluded to, which is this question, which is those, those mental health aspects that are kind of activated by the kind of ambient and environmental conditions um, and things like social connections, anxiety, stress, uh, um, you know, for certain forms of depression. And so we already had that on campus. And you know, the reality is that, that, that COVID has amplified uh, a lot of those concerns because some of the so supports uh, that we ordinarily count on are uh, not there, um, especially human connection. Uh, my colleague, Nicholas Christakis, who's down at Yale has written how important um, this connection is um, to our well-being. I think we've learned more and more. My background is as a sociologist as uh, uh, Taryn said, and you know, we've always said, well, you know, society, it's everything, but you know, I always thought that was just a slogan. Um, it turns out to be really important that uh, for our well-being and um, social connections are the things that have suffered. I, you know, we're really fortunate to have Zoom, uh, but it's really interesting when you think about Zoom, it has a kind of flattening quality. Uh, mm -hmm. People are often tired after Zoom, whereas often when you meet people in person, there's a kind of energizing force that comes out of that. And so it's really interesting to see how these dynamics, um, you know, kind of uh, present themselves. We've tried to set conditions for students to, you know, with small group gatherings, et cetera, who were on campus, off campus, um, and students, you know, um, you know, being in isolation. It, it was a challenge. Um, we also found some challenges that were really interesting. Is that, you know, if you were, um, it's, uh, you know, in some places, telehealth, um, you know, counseling is not permissible. Um, uh, in some places it is, the questions around how that was being done. Um, you know, there were some brighter sides to this in the sense that people did find that actually it was easier to make appointments. 
Um, uh, you could do them at different times. You could get it to somebody, you know, if you wanted late night, you can have a counselor who's in a different time zone. So I think we're going to learn a lot about this, but, you know, I'm not going to, you know, pretend that the mental health issues are not serious, especially the sense of just, you know, exhaustion um, and stress and anxiety. Um, it's really taken a toll um, on us emotionally as a society, I think. Um, and I think we've had to dig deep into our kind of reservoirs of, um, empathy and goodwill. Um, and, and I think, you know, once we get out of this pandemic, it's, we really have to refill those um, in, in significant ways. Yeah, it's going to be an explosion of uh, human kindness and connection, I hope. Uh, I, I hope so, too. You know, when I, when I talk to students and, you know, what they say, what they miss, and they say, I just miss hugging somebody. Yeah. And, you know, I love our students, and I really miss that, too. I just miss those just kind of, you know, that kind of solidarity of, of, of connection and knowing and looking behind somebody's eyes and, uh, and, and you know, just that, that acknowledgement. And I think we're all, I think this is why it's also been so challenging. I think this is why some of the infections, you know, it turns out that one of the main transmissions that we're learning about is um, over meals, yeah, unmasked, et cetera. And eating is such a human thing. It's, act, you know, a lot of evolutionary biologists saying it's like kind of what made us human. Yeah. Um, it was that sort of, you know, cooperative and then joining for meals together. Uh, I don't have to tell people in Napa Valley how important exactly. food and drink exactly. are to the essence of like how we live. So it's December 3rd today. Is the semester, our finals done and our kids going home, students going home for winter break and, our, and who's coming back and what does the next month or two look like? Yeah, so uh, finals are happening uh, right now uh, in the in the next few days. So what we the decision we made was that students would leave after Thanksgiving and uh, they wouldn't be coming back other than the students who needed to stay here um, in, in on campus whose home conditions weren't uh, conducive. And so uh, they left on the 22nd of November and uh, um, basically are finishing off the semester from home um, because what we there was a couple of things we wondered, why do we want to make sure they didn't leave here sick? So they were tested before they left. And second is they're not coming back um, uh, just for a couple of weeks and then going back. So, so students are, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, first year students who were on campus um, are back uh, home. The uh, students who are bringing back next semester are, are we we're actually doubling the size of the number of students we're bringing back. So we're going to 3,100. Um, we're still, the constraint for us is the one bedroom. Um, yeah. you know, be, um, and so we're still going to be teaching remotely. Um, but, you know, we, for those students who want to be on campus for academic purposes. So we've invited our seniors back for their final semester on campus, as well as our juniors. And the reason we invited the juniors back is that it turns out junior year is really critical for many students who are starting independent research projects for their theses or capstone projects. And so uh, we made the decision to bring um, those students back. Um, and then as well as the students whose home conditions uh, um, were not conducive. Uh, we expanded that group to include student international students who live in uh, time zones four plus hours from the Eastern Standard Time Zone. So um, uh, so that that to, we, they, they, they had a hard time in the fall semester. And, and um, it wasn't the courses as much as it was with steady groups and, you know, office hours and those kinds of things. So to try to get them back on synchronous. Were you teaching undergraduates this past semester? No, I'm teaching next semester, but I'm um, teaching a doctoral course next semester. But I, I was not teaching. It's uh, it's the it's the deaning job was like <laughs> taking a lot of time this year to practice, figure out how we were going to get our students back and keep them here safe and uh, you know all of that. So, uh, um, but. Uh, yeah, but I heard you say that all of all even the while um, campus life life proceeds apace, though with a limited headcount, the the students are learning online. So if yeah. I'm a, if I'm teaching economics 101 B, I'm doing so from wherever, but it's all this way, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but you know what was really interesting is that actually, you know. Um, the we you know obviously we do a lot of surveying and um, um, looking at the results and we learned a lot from when we had to make the fast pivot in the spring um, when we had to switch to zoom and um, and we kind of did a lot of analysis you know you always do course surveys and things like that about what worked well what didn't work well the students were able to report 
And we quickly mobilized that into a kind of program for our faculty on how to teach remotely, reimagining assignments, et cetera. We had a thousand of, just in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which we primarily teach the Harvard College students, but a thousand faculty take these courses. And what was really interesting is that, you know, a place like Harvard, where everybody sort of feels like they have to sort of perform perfection, people were like, I don't know how to do this. And so everybody was in this learning mode and faculty reimagined their assignments, et cetera. And the overall reports that we've gotten is, I would sort of say the fall was hard, but good. Um, it was hard because of the pandemic and all the reasons that we're talking about students struggling with anxiety and loss and isolation. Um, and the professors are too, by the way. So the TFs, you know, people are all dealing with this. But it was good in the sense that our faculty, our TFs made really amazing efforts to adapt their courses to this new mode of teaching. And the students almost uniformly rose to the occasion. And in fact, one of the things we heard over and over again from our faculty colleagues, so my colleagues, is that students are doing better work than they've ever seen before. And they've never seen them so engaged. Now, you were distracted. Not doing extracurriculars. There's no <laughs> extracurriculars. There's no, you know, all this other stuff. So, I think it's it's a testament, and I and I'm hearing this at my peer schools also. You know, like you know, we get together every couple of weeks on the Zoom, and I think part of it is is you know the distractions, but I think it's also a sense that how important learning and knowledge is. Um, there's a kind of re appreciation again for the importance for facts mm. and evidence and knowledge and reason thinking and 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 kind of an appreciation for that. Um, that, that our way forward is going to require, and I'm not saying there's one type of truth or stuff, but it, it's going to require a commitment to trying to understand um, what can we get to what's real and understand what's real. I so appreciate the way you talk about a liberal arts education uh, in the way that so much of the, the discussion about the urgent need for post-secondary education is this sort of utilitarian lens about employment and the workforce and the changing nature of work. And it's like, yes, that, all that's beautiful, but learning on its own is what makes us good citizens. It, it gives us discernment and good judgment and it lets us you know, be productive members of society beyond you know, like swinging a hammer or like typing on a keyboard. Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think that's right. I think you know, a lot of people you know, connected immediately to like, you know, what are you gonna do with it? But let me make an interesting pitch for it that it's actually probably the most useful form of education um, uh, now as well. And I say this as an immigrant, as a child of immigrants, when I was growing up, my parents told me there were four jobs in the world. I think it was like doctor, accountant, engineer, and loser. And, um, <laughs> you know, there was always very practical. I, you know, I didn't get into Harvard uh, as an undergrad. It's easier to become dean. Um, but, you know, um, you know I, I was a pre-med initially, and then I switched to economics. And Here's the thing that I would sort of say about, you know, as if there's some parents or family members or guardians here, is a liberal education in a, you know, it prepares you for a life of change. It prepares you for a life of introspection. It prepares you, teaches you how to learn how to learn. And, you know, who would have known, like, for example, that Zoom was going to be this thing? Who would have reimagined, um, you know, uh, the different ways that the world is presenting itself and, you know, certain things that, you know, when my father immigrated to this country, it was really funny. He was asking people like, what should he do? And one person said, you know, you should go and learn COBOL. So COBOL was a programming language. Another guy said to him, you should learn Fortran. Um, that was another programming language. And another person said, you should learn how to think. And uh -huh. You know, and I think that was an interesting thing is that, you know, we don't know the future is so uncertain. It's evolving so quickly. Um, but having the ability to uh, um, see the big picture, to see the connections between subjects, to, you know, so much now what I think has become so important is asking a good question. Yeah. You know, all the facts are sort of, you know, out there, you can Google them, but asking good questions, a well formed question. Um, being able to relate to people different from you, understanding their cultural backgrounds, their histories, how you pull that together to understand motivation, to what ends are people working toward. I mean, this is the stuff you get out of psychology. This is what you get out of sociology, understanding people's cultural histories, social histories, that our identities have different histories attached to them, carry different weights for folks. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that turns, I think, people into 
not only effective citizens, but ultimately effective leaders. Yeah. Well, your um, comments about good questions gives me a perfect segue to pick up a couple more questions from the Q&A box, if I may. Sure. So Jaime wants to know, how is the testing funded? I think I know, but I'd be curious to hear you say, are there any classes being conducted in person? I think we know that's no. Um, how how well, about yeah, so, you know, again, we're really fortunate, and I just want to acknowledge that um, it's, um, you know, we're paying for it yeah. um, um, as an institution. It's, um, it's you know, expensive, um, uh, but getting more cheaper. Um, and we did it not out of ego, um, and, um, but because we wanted to, we think it's really important to begin finding and blazing a path forward for how we can get back to a residential experience. And we thought it was important to experiment our way to it and, and, and learn our way to it. And maybe this sounds a little bit, we believe that our research mission and our teaching mission are critical. Um, it's research that's gonna advance our knowledge to tackle the issues around the virus, but any, also so many other societal issues, uh, inequality issues around racial injustice. And we need, we want, it's critical for us to keep that mission going. And then the transmission of that knowledge to the next generation is really critical. So those are, are kind of, you know, we're our foci for um, doing this. And to us, putting those resources behind that was really critical and sharing the learnings that we were doing uh, was really critical. Um, you're right that the college was not doing any in-person education, but Harvard Business School was. So oh. They were experimenting with hybrid um, and um, they did um, show that it could work. It, you know, one of the big wrinkles uh, in any kind of hybrid um, is you're playing to two audiences at once. Right. And that kind of figuring out that kind of I wouldn't say it's a technical issue as much as it's a stylistic issue about making sure people feel included. I uh, have a, three kids in school. So one who's started medical school in, um, remotely and then two in college. And my middle daughter, um, her school did do hybrid in fall, but then the faculty quickly went and said, I'm, I'm just gonna do all remote um, because it was a little bit hard to go back and forth. Now there's pedagogies and subjects that we really want to you know, the learning by doing and kind of, um, you know, those type of courses that really require, uh, you know, lab-based courses, et cetera. So we're working to um, experiment um, and pilot a different ways of having some levels of academic engagement on that. Um, the last thing I would say is you have to remember we're an intergenerational community. And so while our students, you know, they're in a different place in the sort of age demographic and, um, you know, even though some people might have underlying conditions, you know, our faculty is my age uh, and older and we have, you know, this conditions that we all come to in the world with uh, or get over time as part of aging. And so we really wanted to keep our community healthy, our dining hall workers, our custodial workers, our faculty. Um, we didn't want to be the source of spread. Totally. You talked about sharing some of the, of the lessons learned and Donneen, another one of my wonderful board members is asking that very thing, sort of, what, are, what, what has surprised you in this and what might you carry forward? You know, so many of us are like, you know, thinking uh, with a new perspective about, well, maybe in a year's time, some of us are still telecommuting, for example, because it's just more, a more efficient way and so forth. So are there things that you've seen so far that you think might abide um, once we're over the hump? That's a great question. So, you know, you know, the one thing that, you know, I think is really important and I was really grateful when Terrence, when you started again, your, your talk is this is a moment where mission and values matter um, and just being clear and transparent so people can understand how you're making decisions. I think that's one of the things I've always, I start every talk with the mission and, you know, I think, um, you know, but what we also did was articulate the values by which we were going to conduct ourselves. So we said, you know, right away, our highest priority is to support our community's health and its well-being. Second was sustaining the excellence of Harvard in both learning and research and continuing to hold ourselves to the highest standards. Third was adopting an evidence-based management approach to the COVID-19 challenge and that our decisions would be guided by public officials and health experts and that we were gonna to adhere to the spirit of the rules, not just the technicality of them. And that we would transparently communicate our policies and decision-making processes and any evolution in these acknowledging that we're facing considerable ambiguity and uncertainty. Yeah. So what did we learn? 
we learned actually a bunch of things that I think we're gonna carry over. One is that there's many aspects of Zoom students really like. Um, you know, uh, the chat function in particular, the ability to have that kind of intellectual back and forth with their peers while learning. Um, the office hours by Zoom turn out to be way more popular than office hours that faculty had by their office. Yeah. You know, I have been a faculty member for 25 years. You sit there and you wait to see if anybody's ever going to come. Right. Um, Tuesdays at 10. The doors uh, open. Yeah. Office hours were packed and huh. students like going in groups and they like to hear what their peers are saying. And it was just a naturalization back and forth. The faculty actually keeping the Zoom session starting, keeping it open a few minutes early and then lingering afterward. The dialogue and the interchange that happened in that, in that community that kind of formed through that. So there's things about thinking about how do we bring that back into when we get in person or you know, the, the, maybe doing office hours by Zoom may be better. It was really easier for many, um, I was just talking to a colleague in the arts, the kind of guests that they were able to bring um, to their class was incredible. I mean, these are like superstar musicians and uh, people's, you know, leading uh, art figures who would not have made a two day trip from California right. for a one hour class session or an hour and a half class, like no problem. Uh, you know, the great composers that are living and things like you just have uh, folks like that. So I think that admissions, boy, we were able to reach students who might not have otherwise considered Harvard um, and high schools that would, you know, may not have ever even understood our financial aid plan and all of those kinds of things that like, you know, they had no idea that if you come from a family that makes less than $65,000 a year, you go to Harvard for free. No loans, no nothing, like nothing. That yeah. if you make up to 150,000, that, that we don't charge more than 10% of the family's income and we don't look at assets. Um, you know, these things that where people thought things were just inaccessible, our ability to sort of reach groups and people, populations, uh, who might not have actually had encounters with what folks like us are saying, our policies, um, that, and our, our commitment to inclusion, our commitment to financial inclusion, um, our recognition that talent is everywhere, but opportunities are not, and that we see that that is our key role is bringing those two things together. So I think there's a lot of things like that. We're going to have to think about this and do kind of after action kind of reflections, but um, already we can imagine, you know, just new ways of knowing, new ways of understanding, you know, and, and, and actually just reaching out. Um, our extension school, which, you know, particularly, you know, is, is focused on part-time learners. Um, you know, there's, we can bring what we do to more people um, and make it more accessible and widely available. That is yet another segue, because I was hoping we could talk a little bit about, okay, let's take a step back and, you know, put our Saul Khan hat on and think about this amazing wealth of wisdom, all these amazing faculty and how we can amortize them across a larger body of, of the American public, not just at Harvard, but at other places. Before I ask you to opine on that, I just want to acknowledge that Liz and Peg and Brad all asked a question that you just answered. So they're really prescient, which was sort of how might some of the teaching practices change or what might stick around? So I just want to thank them for those questions and hope that we didn't, that we got to the spirit of them. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of talk of like, hey, if my kid gets into Stanford, I don't know, I might defer because I, you know, might send him to the JC because goodness gracious, why would I pay X a year to have him sit in a dorm room? So you're hearing some of that. I'm just curious to hear your take. Yeah, you know, again, I think, you know, first of all, I, I just think it's important that people get educated. We're really fortunate that we have so many um, great colleges and universities um, in this country. Um, and there's so many heterogeneous ones. There's so many different kinds. And um, <clears throat> also I just wanna say that, you know, just because somebody didn't go to college, I think one of the things that we have to do is make sure that everybody recognizes and feels dignified and respected. Mm -hmm. Some of the smartest people I know um, that I knew as a kid growing up in New York, didn't go to college, didn't have the opportunity, wasn't the right thing for them. And so I think one of the things that I really want to sort of, you know, just right from the start saying that I think there's a lot of different pathways. And I think that's really what this, for me, the thing is, there should be lots of different pathways for people to get learning and find the way kind of learning they need at the time that they need uh, it. And so I think we do have to reimagine um, education in some really fundamental ways. Um, you know, one we were just talking about is how do we take 
you know, there used to be two things that, you know, people used to come to Harvard for. One was that the, you know, the faculty and the second was the library. Well, Google's digitized the library and the faculty are on YouTube. So, you know, like, I think we can go a lot further, right? Bringing all of our educational institutions resources to a larger part of the world, which I think is a really important part of what we do. I think the second is this, you know, and I know it sounds like a cliche, um, is, you know, deliver world-class learning experiences for part-time learners, um, depending on where people are. And so I think, you know, thinking about, can we reach people who are in high school, junior colleges, et cetera, and, and how do we do that in a way that's affordable and sustainable? Um, and because that's the only way we're gonna reach more people. Um, and, 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 and I actually think, you know, I, I, I really do love being a teacher and a professor. I love being at the institution I'm in. Um, but I know it presents a contradiction because we also know that college has become the sort of differentiator between accessing a middle class life and not. And so it's this weird dilemma. It's an incredible source of social mobility and also the creation of inequality. And so to me, part of it is we've got to find more pathways, um, you know, in connection. I would also say we've got to sort of get rid of this whole kind of notion of what's an elite school, et cetera. I think that is really unhelpful and um, not true. I mean, it's, uh, you know, some of the, what, what we often describe as elite is more a function of how old you are mm. uh, and not necessarily uh, anything else. I, I, I just think that we have to really recognize there's just so many amazing institutions. I think we have to really invest in our public institutions. Um, I went to, I started off my life in college at, um, in SUNY Binghamton, which is a state university, part of the state university system in New York. Um, I had a professor who told me I should transfer uh, from SUNY Binghamton to Cornell, which is where I ended up, you know, finishing my college and my sophomore, started going, going over my sophomore year and then finishing off college. And so one of the things that, you know, is really apparent to me is, first of all, you know, what we're talking about here is what makes something elite is, has much more to do with the resources that are being invested. And, um, and in particular, the resources that we're investing so that students can actually, you know, focus on their education, um, get the support they need and the help they need at the right time when they need it. And, you know, that's, that's where we need to do our attention, you know, and so I'm really glad you brought up the UC system, which I think is one of the most incredible systems that we have. Um, it is an incredible asset that California has, um, you know, the whole, Cal um, that, that Clark Kerr and others created in post-war period from yeah. the community colleges to the state college system to the major research universities, and just kind of a monkey bar of different ways of people finding what's right and lifelong learning. And so, I think that can make a lot of sense. Um, I think transferring is, can be hard in some institutions because be, you just don't have the room. Um, as I often say, you know, the reason we, we would admit st more students if we could, we just don't have the beds for them. Yeah, um, especially now. And, yeah, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, that's, it's, it's not that there's any different between the student we couldn't admit and the student we did. It's just, you know, we're trying to create that kind of environment. So I, ju I just think, you know, there's a lot to learn. And I think the most important way we can do is being generative and, 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 sh and making sure that we are reaching more people um, um, in, in a way. And, um, and I think, you know, th there's work that we all have to do here. And I think higher education has really been trying to do this work, but this is a real moment for self-reflection. For sure. Um, well, I'm a proud graduate of UC Berkeley. So thank you for your endorsement. It's still going strong. It only cost $700 a year when I went there. Let me tell you that. Um, though I think it doubled by the time I graduated. Um, if you can indulge us, there's a couple more questions. I want to honor your time and thank you just so richly for oh, joining us. Um, Doug uh, um, would like to know, you know, it seems like academia has a playbook for a pandemic and it's, and it's working um, on certain campuses. And do you, do you think that there's a role if we face a similar situation, another pandemic in future that academia might be called on by say the federal government to um, lend perspective or uh, a playbook? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Doug. And um, I think, you know, we're, you know, again, you know, I think part of it is, I think there was some sense of what needed to be done. It just kind of got somewhere, you know, just at the polarized times that we lived in. Um, I think we lost kind of sight of it. Um, but I do think that, you know, one of the things that's interesting is the CDC has been kind of doing some case studies on the higher education institutions in terms of how they've managed the pandemic. And uh, Terrence, as you mentioned earlier, that in many cases, the 
uh, infection rates were often much lower on, in the, on campus than they were in the communities in which they're embedded. And so I think there's a lot of learning that's going on uh, from that. Um, I think you know, part of it is probably the most significant playbook would be for K through 12 schools um, to think about how um, that could work. I think that to me is really where we've got to focus a lot of our energy and attention. The, you know, it, it's amazing to see that the entire kind of uh, global capitalist system depends on elementary school teachers. Yeah. Um, it, and, and public school teachers and, 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 you know, a group of people, we just, you know, need to be, you know, more strengthened and uh, we need, you know, and who literally shape our future um, and getting them back and getting the kids back into those classes is probably one of the most critical things we can do as a country uh, right now. And so I think, um, you know, the testing, I think is going to be helpful. Uh, you know, I, I happen to live next door to an elementary school. Um, and so actually out of my window, I look and see the kids, just, like they adapt, they wear their masks, they know how to appropriately, I mean, they're just amazing. And so I think hopefully those kinds of things will kind of inform us the next time. Uh, hopefully there's not a big next time, but inevitably we've got to prepare for that. I think, you know, we all hope for the best, but we got to prepare for the, these kinds of inevitabilities. Um, you know, the, the, the pandemic has really caused a rupture and, you know, it's a human species competing with an RNA virus. Um, these are two living thing organisms that, you know, have these very complex relationships with each other. Well, we haven't we learned that schools as a category, particularly with younger children, are not the super spreaders that we feared they would be, right? So, I can't speak to that. I don't know the, I don't yeah. have the sort of clear data, but I, you know, I think it is sort of, you know, the children, there's definitely something going on differently with children. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you'll indulge us, I have two more questions. Yeah, One is from my friend, Bob, who um, says, unlike Harvard, the, uh, the tech college um, down the river didn't bring its freshman students back. And he, and he wonders how you may have wrestled as an institution with a sort of legal exposure of like, oh my gosh, if we, you know, if we do or we don't. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I mean, always, you always worry about like, you know, making sure we're we doing the right thing and, you know, what are, what are the, what are the trade-offs and doing the right thing? I, I think we just really wrestled with what could we do safely? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and we always had the academic, so we had two things right in front of us, public health and the academic mission. And we really spent a lot of time thinking like, you know, who academically, if we, if we have to have them on campus, would this most positively impact? Um, and, you know, there, it, the differences between high school and college are pretty stark. Uh, in terms of learning approach, much more self-study in high uh, in in college than in high school. The sort of seminar format, which often is something that one has to get up to speed on, um, being able to access the resources, being comfortable accessing tutoring, being able to understand going to office hours, all of those kinds of things like that that we felt that beginnings mattered there. It's mm -hmm. kind of set the imprint and that. We also said though, that if we're able to bring back students in the spring, we wanted to bring seniors back. And again, it was very much motivated by the academic reasons. They were finishing their theses. It was a kind of their capstone projects and culminating that. And so that, that provided for us a lens, um, you know, the way I think about things. Um, so in my role as a leader, um, you know, I, and I, teach, I happen to teach organization, I teach leadership at Harvard Business School. And, you know, and, but I'd never like been in the role where right, where you had the responsibility. Now you as, as the Dean, I have you know, some responsibility and accountability. And it's really interesting is that, you know, what I've learned is that, you know, I have a lot of great people around me. So, you know, the, the, the legal folks, they dispense caution. Mm -hmm. Here's the risks and you understand them. And uh, my communications folks, you know, they are like, you know, paint this great, you know, this. And, and I realized that like, you know, the role of leadership is really to dispense hope. Hmm. And so um, that's kind of what we are. And then you sort of understand, you know, you wanna be cognizant of the risks. Um, you wanna, you know, be able to communicate why the rationale that you're doing, but ultimately as a leader, 
I think your job is to show a way forward um, and to um, build a, a sense of hope and possibility. And a lot of people think hope is this kind of future oriented thing. And what I learned this past few months is that, you know, I started off the mission with the history of this country. Um, but actually a real generation of hope is looking at your past. Mm -hmm. Things, when things seem really difficult and really challenging and uncertain, and you can actually see, wait, we were able to manage through that. What did we do in order to do that? Well, we worked together. Um, we deepened our sort of wells of empathy for each other. Uh, we learned to be hard on the problem and easy on each other. Mm. Uh, we worked in boundaryless ways. Um, in fact, these things actually ended up being society, you know, for our institutions, when we looked back at these crises, they actually ended up being kind of almost crucible events where the we came out of that a better institution than we went in. So, you know, just to, again, you know, I know we only have a minute left, um, but like, you know, the, the, the civil war is the time when Harvard shifted from being like a local college educating New England elites for religious life to becoming a research university. World War I is when Harvard really built out for the first time um, the idea of, of elective courses uh, and different majors. Um, World War II, obviously we know the impact that had on sort of just research and the role of the federal government, National Science Foundation, all those things being created. And each of these things were ruptures and they were incredibly challenging and costly. But I think just like our own individual lives, right? You know, what I've often been interested in, and, and I know Terrence, you know, we are now of the age where we know that things happen in life. For me, what's always been so interesting is, you know, people who face a, situ a really difficult situation and you see, just people respond to it very differently. For some people, they turn inward, they become reticent, they, you know, kind of shy away from the world or they become angry or bitter. And that same event for another person sort of causes a sense of introspection and, and in fact strengthens commitment and ex, you know they, they sort of expand their sort of circles of concerns and and and, yeah. and 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 to me you know I think organizations and even societies can make you know can 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 do that and I think figuring out how we always do the latter um, and I think it's through connection it's through remembering who we were other things that we've had um, that we've overcome um, and using that to imagine new possibilities, being vulnerable, um, um, but also being willing to, you know, sort of share in, in our kind of common fate. And I think that's the kind of way that I think we can all respond. That seems like a beautiful note on which to, um, sadly, I, I'd love to keep talking all night, uh, but it's even later where you are. I'm so grateful you could join us. And I would just wanna, I just wanna say uh, a word of appreciation for the decision Harvard made to make sure that the kids who didn't have a suitable um, climate to, in which to learn at home, which almost certainly is a proxy for kids whose parents earn less than some of, some of the other parents and, and some other things. It's just a, a, a beautiful thing that you, that you prioritize them uh, being back on campus with the freshmen and so forth. So I think that's great. So here's how it works in Napa. The coin of the realm is food and wine. And when you can travel again, what it needs to happen is you have to come and be our guest here so we can say thank you for this really, really illuminating and, and thought provoking conversation. So thank you, Rakesh, it's great to see you. Oh, thank you, it's so great to see you. And uh, thank you to everybody for the thoughtful questions in the audience and um, um, please be well. Um, um, I'm sending a lot of positive karma from Cambridge. Here, here. We'll hope to see you soon. Okay. All right. Take care. Good night. Just to note, everybody, the next um, speaker is uh, Mayor Michael Tubbs from Stockton, California, and that's January 28th. So we're going to go dark until then. Have a joyful and safe holiday season, and I hope to see uh, many of you back in January. Thanks so much for joining us.